Hi folks, welcome to another episode of ASP.NET Core from Zero to Overkill. In this episode, continuing on the topic of event-driven integration, we'll infer events from EF core changes. So the the goal will be to for us to check out where can we put the logic for event creation and storage, as we introduced the outbox pattern in the previous episode and we'll start implementing it. Then we'll see how to override EF core save changes method as a way to to do this, but we'll get there later. And finally, we'll infer events from the from the change tracker. Before getting into the episode itself, I just want to put a quick reminder because I wanted to do this earlier, but I forgot, which is many of the problems that we are facing here in this event integration topic are already solved by some existing libraries. So when doing this, consider if using these libraries can handle all these problems for you. Maybe you have some specific issues that they don't solve. So in this case, you might want to do manually, but otherwise it's probably a better idea to do things using these libraries that already solve these problems. Some options that exist in .NET land are mass transit and, and service bus. So you might want to check them out or maybe even check out other alternatives. In the case of the series, I'm rolling my own because I want to make these problems really show and also because it's just fun to, to, to write this kind of code and see these, these kinds of issues that normally are, I think, a bit ignored. Uh, but I wanted just to put this reminder to anyone that sees what I'm doing here, not think that we really need to do everything manually. No, we have to consider the problems, but maybe we can use something that solves this for us. So I wanted to, to add this note. So before actually starting the usual plugs, if the videos are being useful, please drop a like, share, leave feedback. And for more info, check out the blog, always a post accompanying the these kinds of videos. Uh, for more info, reach out on Twitter. To ask questions live, consider, considering, consider uh, visiting me on Twitch. Uh, otherwise, the, the, the archive is on YouTube and you have more contacts on the blog and on my personal website. So, let's go. So, let me just go back to the topics to have some guidance. So, the first question is where to put this event creation logic, creation and storage logic. So normally what I would do would be taking something like from DDD or something like that would be inside the entity itself. So for instance, this is user. So inside the playball user or inside the, the service, in this case, the user manager, I would create the, the event and put it somewhere that it will, it would be eventually persisted. In this case, it's not that easy to do that because the um, this is implemented by something from ASP.NET Core identity. So maybe we could do something, notice that this is virtual. So maybe we could do something to wrap around this or make a, a class that inherits from this one, something like that. But it's not super easy and uh, yeah, because we have no control. But if it was completely code on our control, that would be the solution. Uh, so for something like you might check out, let me see. Let me go here. This is the clean architecture uh, template from Steve Smith and something he does, I think it's in the core. Where is it shared? Yeah, he has a base entity and he keeps a list of the domain events in this list. So inside the, the entity, when something happens, uh, the entity just appends. So probably if I go over to core entities, to do item, the to do item adds events there. So I would do something like this. It seems like a nice approach, but because we are using code from uh, ASP.NET Core identity, we can 
really do that easily, maybe with some tricks. Another alternative, as we saw in the past episode, what we want for this Outbox implementation is to do things in a single transaction, to be sure that everything is persisted at the same time. So, something we could do would be like right here in the register CSHTMLCS, so on post async where the user will be created, we could do something like uh, begin transaction, then get this result, and if succeed, we could add event and commit transaction, something like this. Else, rollback transaction. We could do something like this as well, but it doesn't seem right because here on the controller we probably should, we shouldn't be creating transactions and doing stuff like this. It's a bit weird, so it feels out of place. And that's why the, the ideal place was, like I mentioned, inside here or in the entity. So this isn't really a good, a great approach. So what I thought would be an approach that we could take would be to do this uh, taking advantage of extensibility points of Entity Framework Core. So, uh, this is a technique that's used in other scenarios, uh, but in this case, we would override save changes. Let me go to close this, close this, ignore this part. We could override save changes like this and do things in here. So, and this is a technique that's used in more places. I can show, for instance, in that same repository from Steve Smith, what he does is, after saving changes, he goes to the change tracker, finds the instances of that base entity, checks for the events, and then sends the events. So this would be a way, even though he, he has that other part with the entities, but in the safe changes is just uh, forwarding the event. Other implementations take advantage of, of us being able to override safe changes for something like uh, when we have some properties that we want to set automatically every time. So I have here a blog post. Okay. We have here a blog post. And uh, basically what's being done is that there is this entity information regarding modified date and modified username, which is something that we want to always set in in every place. Every time we create such a, uh, we change such an entity, we want to change these properties. And doing it manually is a needed work, and we can forget about it. So what the author of this post is doing is on safe changes, checking every entity that has those properties and setting them correctly. So this is a strategy of writing save changes is a strategy that's used often to implement these kinds of things. In our case, we have a bit more logic, weird world logic, because we are going to infer the events right here. We could, like you saw, do it some other way, but doing it this way, we avoid uh, polluting here this part and we can continue using the ASP.NET Core identity stuff and we'll be able to because we are using EF Core to hook up here detect those things so how do we detect those things you might have noticed from the, the this part and the other post that over here we have something that is the change tracker and in here we can check out multiple things. So we could go here and for instance we want to find all entries in this case of playball user. 
and imagine we want to get all users registered so users registered we can do like aware and we check that the entity state equals added so a newly created entity that will be persisted right now will be in this state and with this we know what users were created so this is a way to implement this and we can do this for all kinds of events instead of doing everything over here in the safe changes and having a big safe changes with a ton of logic for all the events that we might need instead of this what i thought about would be a nice approach would be and this is where it comes from i invented some interface named i event detector that gets injected in the db context and over here each i event detector can be implemented for instance for detecting one for each kind of event which seems like a interesting approach and in this case so that's why we inject an i enumerable because we might have multiple detectors and just do this uh, the part for actually creating the events will be in the next episode in this one we are just inferring them as the title suggests and that's it this interface just as a detect method that gets the db context so it goes there it can use it to do what it needs and that's all for these safe changes for now and then we just call base.safe changes a uh, side note i'm just overriding safe changes i think one of the overloads but there are there is one more overload and it and there is the safe changes without async variant so for this to be complete we should override all of those variants to be sure that we cover all the bases i'm not going to do it just because it's not really needed here because this is the most common used safe changes but just in case for something really well done we should override all the variations to be sure we don't get a surprise so now we should take a look at those detectors just to see what they are doing so they implement this interface let's start with the registered and deleted are the simplest ones so this is a bunch of code just because of logging and stuff but you can recognize this code that i just showed which is we go to the database change tracker find entries for playable user where entity state added just to list to have things in 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 place and then right now i'm just doing a for each and logging all the events that are detected as I mentioned in the next episode, we'll change this to instead of just logging, actually transforming this into event. User deleted is basically the same. So, but instead of added, there is the deleted. Finally, user updated is slightly my, more complicated, but just because I have some specific logic. So let's just see. Uh, identity user has a branch of properties if we go so besides the username there is email email confirmed password security stuff phone number and all of that so instead of uh, this would suffice just checking if the state is modified for us to send an event saying that the user was updated but because we are going to use this to send events to outside to to other services instead maybe the other services depends on your use case but in the use case i'm imagining the user the other services don't need to know that the password changed or that the two-factor authentication was enabled and stuff like that in our case we just need to worry about the kind of information that we want other services to have and right now i only feel like the other services need to know about the username maybe in the future something changes right now i just want to worry about the username and that's why besides checking that the entity is modified we can again with this entity entry class there are these original values and current values so these original values are the ones that were there 
when the user were, was fetched from the database and current values are the ones that are were set in the in this specific request and so i'm checking if the username property is has changed from one to the other if it has changed then we want to send an event so the other services know oh the username changed otherwise no need because well uh, the other services don't care if the user updated but that's the only difference the rest same logic and then logging information for this we can just take a look at, at this working we open it open up this here for us to see the logs so let me open the browser and if I, for instance, don't know if this account exists. What about right now? I'll just create a new one. So test one, three, four, five, six. Login. No, oh, register. And we should see a log here saying that hopefully registered or not. There should be a log here somewhere saying that the user was registered. No, new user created, there it is. No, not this one. Now, ah, here it is. So, user registered event, test, at test. So, if we go here to account, and I say 33, save. And somewhere should be another log like that one. Somewhere. That's a ton of logs. I'll try to find updated, but this search doesn't seem to help a lot. Let me just check what I call here. User updated event should find something. Oh, here it is. So user updated event, change detector. So you see, this way we are detecting things. And that's about it for what I wanted to show in this episode. This is a strategy, like I mentioned, you can do it multiple ways, but I found it interesting to show you this strategy right now because it has a lot of possi possibilities even for other things other than inferring events and also uh, felt like a good opportunity for to go into this change tracker and the things that we can check out from it and that's it so in the next episode we'll work on this uh, improve on this to instead of just detecting actually mapping them to events and storing them in the outbox table but as i'm trying to keep things smaller that's it for this episode uh, yeah so that's it hope it was useful you enjoyed it and see you in the next one see yes <laughs>